I think we can all agree, we astrophotographers are an ambitious group of people. We want to get the best pictures and for that we invest a lot of time and a lot of money. And as long as we can reach a delta in quality, we're almost willing to do anything. And that's okay. In German we have a saying, der Zweck heiligt die Mittel, which means so much as the purpose justifies the means. Now there is one exception, and that is if we invest time or money and we get nothing in return. And these cases we want to cover in today's video. Hey, this is Fear Into Space. I'm Sascha from Switzerland. So grüezi miteinander and thanks for watching my channel. So there are three misunderstood topics which I would like to cover with you today where we actually a lot of times overdo it and could actually save some time and or money. And let's dive right into the first one and that is flats. Now flats are a very vital part of our imaging activities. And a lot of times the quality of our end product depends heavily on the quality of the flats. And at the moment automatic flat panels are booming. And if you're interested in one of these, I've seen a few videos in the last weeks of Deep Space Dad, which produces these automatic flat panels for a rather reasonable amount. And the reviews are rather good. So you might look into that. But before you go now and order these, let's think about it. Because why do we need an automatic flat panel? Because we believe that after each and every shot we do, we should do flats. And the question is, is that a valid thought? So let's think about why we're doing flats. So there might be some dust bunnies on the sensor glass. There might also be some dust bunnies on our filters. And last but not least, there might be vignetting based on the telescope. And that's it. These are exclusive three reasons why we're doing flats. If there's anything on the telescope, front glass or on the mirrors, it does not influence our pictures as long as you do not have a dead mouse lying there. So this is not what we want to remove by the flats. So let's think next, when do these factors change? When it comes to the vignetting, as long as you stay within the same scope, it stays the same. It also stays the same if you rotate the camera because the vignetting is at most scopes, even Steven. Now let's come to the dust bunnies. And in principle, if you leave the imaging train closed, the dust bunnies stay most likely the same. You really have to be unlucky or it's really for weeks and weeks where your telescope stands in a dusty carpet. But when you have it outside or from one night to the other, it is very unlikely that the dust actually squeezes itself through your filter wheel or somewhere else and sits now suddenly on the filter or on the sensor glass. Usually these dust accumulation happen at the moment where your imaging train is open. Which means if you have a filter wheel, your imaging train will not open. And given when you rotate your camera, your sensor glass, as well as your filter rotates with your camera and stays the same, rotating does not change anything when it comes to the flats. And long story short, what this really means is, if you have a filter wheel, if you do not for any reason actually open up your imaging train, you do not have to redo the flats. And I personally use master flats and master dark flats, which are months old and they work perfectly. And I mean, if out of whatever reason, a dust bunny would actually suddenly find its way in onto the filter, I would see that. And then there would be time to do an additional series of flats. 
So my recommendation is, if until now you worked with filter drawers, rather spend the money on a filter wheel than on an automatic flat panel. Flat panel is great in any way, but a filter wheel, even for OSC, is an absolutely great investment. Not only do you save time as you do not have to do the flats every time, but you also decrease the risk that a filter falls down or that gets a fingerprint on it or gets additional dust. And even on OSC, sometimes I need the narrowband filter and then I need the light pollution filter for the stars. So you can program that in your sequence. Next topic, guiding. I know it's an absolutely great feeling if we can actually brag that because of our mount, because of our encoder, because of our guiding skills, we get an RMS of 0.2. And everybody will envy you. But does this really make your pictures better? And for that, we have a very easy formula. And that's this one here. 206 times sensor pixel size divided by focal length. And let me make you a few examples that you see what I mean. Let's start with my situation. I have an ASI 2600 MC, has a pixel size of 3.76. So we have 206 times 3.76. Now on top, I have an FRA 400, so 400 millimeters. So we divide that now by 400 millimeters. So I get a 1.94 arc seconds by pixel. And what does that mean? It means that if I can get to an RMS of about 1.5, it's perfect. Anything below that is just for bragging rights, but it will not improve my picture. And 1.5, like any decent scope guide camera combination, can accomplish that. So if you have only any wide scope like a red cat or like an FRA 400, something like that. You do not need a great mount. You do not need to invest a lot of time in optimizing your guiding. Just press here, dummy, PhD, let it do the guiding and whatever comes out, it will be good enough. So let's do the same calculation with 600 millimeters. See here, and it's almost the same. 1.29, again, an RMS of one or even a little bit above, and you're fine. Once again, practically any mount with a bit of guiding can deliver that to you. Now, the only point where this really matters is when we go far, far up on the focal length. Let's take, for example, my CPC 800 with, and I take now the reducer, 1350 millimeters. And now, we're at 0.57. And ironically, with such heavy scopes, guiding is the most difficult. And mounts who can provide such a good guiding for these heavy scopes are rather expensive. And you know, I always prided myself having my CPC 800 on a wedge and the wedge was doing so good. But at the end, from a guiding point of view, I got perhaps on a good night at a 1.2, sometimes just two or even above from an RMS. And then I wondered why I had these eggy stars, because this guiding was by far not sufficient for this focal length. And today I'm aware of that, but at the beginning I wasn't. So this formula is really very helpful to see where you are from a guiding point of view, and that you do only invest money or time in a better guiding if it is really needed. Otherwise, you just waste your time and your money. And now let's come to the last and also probably most controversial point. And there's probably some people who will shoot me for that again, but that's okay, just, just leave your critic in the comments below. Exposure links. You know, there's these people who brag that they can get with their mount guiding. We, we get again in the guiding, but can accomplish 20, 30 minutes exposures without any issue. And again, it is something for bragging rights. It, it's cool. But the question is again, does it make any sense? 
because the longer you want to expose, the more precise equipment you need, the more you have to optimize everything, the better the balancing has to be, and so on and so on. So is it worth all the additional time and money to achieve these long exposures? So there are hour-long videos discussing this topic, so I will keep it short and sweet. What is the advantage of long exposures? There's two advantages. One is you have less read noise because every time a picture is read, there's some read noise. So the fewer pictures you're actually stacking, the fewer read noise you have. And the other advantage is that you're faster with stacking because the time the computer takes to stack your picture depends heavily on the number of exposures. Now the second advantage, the stacking time is undisputed. But let's go back to the read noise. Because the read noise is not all the noise that we have. We have the sky glow. So the light pollution, for example, the seeing. All this stuff which also produces noise. And this noise gets very fast much more prominent than the read noise. And in fact, it is in most cases so strong that it drowns the read noise, so that the read noise is irrelevant, especially with our day's camera that we're using. Then I stated all that stays as an advantage of longer exposures is the time you save for stacking. Now let's look at the disadvantages of long exposures. First of all, no matter how good your guiding is, your guiding is always fluctuating. And so the risk that the guiding errors impact your picture gets higher the longer your exposures are. The risk that external factors like vibration, like wind, is influencing your picture increases the longer your exposures are. And then, greetings from Elon Musk, the chance that you get a satellite or also an airplane or stray lights from a car who passes by, gets into your scope and ruins your exposure, gets bigger and bigger the longer your exposures are. And last but not least, the less exposure you do, the less dithering you do. So I think you see where I'm headed. The disadvantages of long exposures outweigh by a lot of times the advantages. And the only disadvantage which you have with small exposures, the longer stacking time, you can easily mitigate with a faster computer. And just to be clear, there is an exception. If you're shooting in absolute dark skies, portal one or two, the read noise really might make an impact and then it might make sense to do longer exposures. But in any other case, keep it short and sweet. For star clusters, galaxies, 30, 40 seconds will be enough. For narrow band shooting of Nebula, three minutes, an absolute maximum of five minutes is more than enough. Anything above five minutes is absolutely pointless from my perspective. So that was it. I hope that was valuable or at least interesting. I'm sure there's lots of you who have different opinions. Happy to hear that. In the comments below, we can discuss it here, or if you would like to discuss it more extensively in a smaller setting, have a look at my Patreon channel, link is in the description below. We'll be happy to see you over there. And in any case, see you next time, and clear skies.